and welcome to this video. It's Dr. Ryan here again with another helpful topic in internal medicine. Today we are discussing Takayasu arteritis. Okay, so we're going to start off with a clinical case as always. And we're going to look at where Takayasu fits into the grand scheme of things in terms of the vasculitic syndromes. And we're going to talk about Takayasu in terms of diagnosis and pathophysiology clinical features, different types, investigations, treatment, and of course, we're going to close with some encouragement from scripture. So, fasten your seatbelts, folks. Here we go. Here's our clinical question. All of the following vasculitic syndromes are thought to be due to immune complex deposition with one exception. What is that exception? Is it A, cryoglobulinemic vasculitis, B, granulomatosis with polyangitis, previously termed Wegener's granulomatosis, is it C, Henoch Shawn 9 purpura, D, polyritis nodosa associated with hepatitis B, or is it E, serum sickness? Hmm, I wonder. Okay, guys. So when it comes to systemic vasculitis, we partition them based on the size of the vessel. So we have three branch points, large vessel, medium vessel, and small vessel. Alrighty. So on a large vessel, there's three different types. There's giant cell arthritis, Takayasu, and then secondary causes, okay? On the medium vessel, there's polyritis nodosa, often associated with hepatitis B, but can be standalone as well. Kawasaki disease and secondary causes. Kawasaki mainly affects our pediatric population. Small vessel is broadly partitioned into whether it's anchor positive and anchor negative. Of the anchor positive variety, we have granulomatosis with polyangiitis, previously termed Wegener's granulomatosis, eosinophilic GPA, previously termed Chirk strohs and there's microscopic polyangiitis, and then the secondary causes. But anchor negative small vessel vasculitic syndromes, here we think about henoch shawn and purpura, cryoglobulinemic vasculitis, Bechet's disease, anti base membrane disease, urticarial vasculitis, and secondary causes. But for all intents and purposes in this video, we are focusing on our beloved Takayasu arthritis. What is Takayasu arthritis really? It is a chronic inflammatory granulomatous pan arthritis. By pan, we mean it involves all three layers, the tunica intima, tunica media, tunica adventitia. And nobody really knows what causes Takayasu. But what we do know is that it has a predilection for the elastic arteries, commonly the aorta and its major branches, the carotids, the ulnar arteries, the brachial artery, radial and auxiliary artery, and may on occasion involve the pulmonary artery, but really the abdominal aorta. Uh, and when it involves the renal artery, obviously, you know, the sequelae is obstruction. Okay, it's more common in females. In fact, the female to male ratio is 80 to 1, right? What are the main pathological changes we encounter in Takayasu arthritis? Well, we said it's a panarthritis. It involves all three layers of the blood vessel wall. We have intimal hyperplasia, thickening of the media and adventitia, and later on we have fibrosis, all right? So this is just a histopathological uh, specimen showing us involvement of this, the ascending aorta. Uh, so let's just get my pointer in there. The ascending aorta, we can see here, all these are the elastic arteries, right? This is the descending thoracic aorta. We can see the in intimal hyperplasia and fibrosis here affecting the aortic arch, the left subclavian, the abdominal aorta, all right? Uh, okay. So what are the clinical features in Takayasu arthritis? Uh, well, it's common in young females uh, between the ages of 25 to 30, more amongst the Asian uh, population. In the acute stage, the patient may complain of fever, malaise, weight loss, arthralgia, myalgia, very non-specific symptoms. But a clue is that they have inflammatory markers which are high. So a high erythrocyte sedimentation rate as well as a high C-reactive protein. But in the chronic stage, that's when they complain of things like dizziness and headache and syncope. And they may have upper limb claudication, okay? There may be aortic regurgitation, renal artery stenosis, and angina. And when you are palpating the pulses, you note uh, asymmetrical pulses, right? Because this is called pulseless disease, right? Hypertension can occur on a renal vascular basis in between 32 and 93 percent, uh, right? I beg your pardon, that probably is 32 and 39 percent. What are the types of Takayasu arthritis? 
Well, there's four different types. Type 1 involves the aortic arch and its major branches. Type 2 involves the descending aorta and the abdominal aorta. Type 3 involves both types 1 and 2 and may be complicated by aortic regurgitation. Type 4 involves the pulmonary arteries. Right, how do we go about diagnosing tachyostyl arteritis? Well, it's diagnosed by the presence of three or more of the following criteria. So one is a youngster, age of onset less than or equal to 40 years. Then they have claudication in the extremities, diminished pulsation of one or more brachial arteries, a blood pressure discrepancy between the left and right arms by more than 10 mils mercury systolic, a brewery over one or both subclavian arteries or the abdominal aorta, and then if you've got evidence of arteriographic narrowing or occlusion of the entire aorta, it's primary branches or large arteries in the upper or lower extremities that cannot be attributed to atherosclerosis, fibromuscular dysplasia, or any other cause. How do we investigate? Well, on your full blood count, you can find a high erythrocyte sedimentation rate because this, of course, is a granulomatous kind of inflammatory condition. And of course, you may have a normal cytic chromic anemia on the basis of anemia of chronic disease. The CRP is going to be high. Chest X-ray may show cardiomegaly and aortic widening. Serum, immunoglobulin, <laughs> serum immunoglobulin is high. Right, MRI is probably helpful to detect inflammatory thickening of the affected vessels. CT angiogram is helpful to actually detect stenosis, occlusion, and condition of those arteries. Iotography of the aortic arch and its branches is helpful. Renal angiogram, if you're thinking about a renovascular involvement, which demonstrates narrowing, coarctation, and aneurysmal dilation. Okay, outline your treatment approach to Takayasu's arthritis. Very important, guys. So, the mainstay is steroid. High dose steroid which is 1 to 1.5 milligram per kg daily, or 1 to 2 milligram per kg daily, right, prednisolone. If the disease is refractory to steroids, or if you find it difficult to take with the steroids, you can add in methotrexate per os, up to 25 microgram weekly, co-administered with folate, okay? Cyclophosphamide as well can be used in resistant cases. If the disease is refractory, you also may want to consider microphenolate morphotol as a thioprene methotrexate with the prednisone, which is more effective than just giving prednisolone alone, all right? Anti-tumor necrosis factor agents can be used like infliximab, any tanacept, may be given in cases of relapse. Of course, reconstructive vascular surgery in selected cases, uh, angioplasty, stenting, or bypass surgery may be done if there's indeed vascular complications. And of course, you want to address and treat the hypertension. Outline the complications of prognosis in Takiyasu's arthritis. Well, there's a whole truckload of them, guys. This is a vasculitis, right? So, in effect, the, the sequelae is that you may have ischemia and obstruction, or it may rupture and you have hemorrhage, right? So, ischemia is known, heart failure, stroke in the way of intracranial hemorrhage, seizures, all right? Organ failure, retinopathy, renovascular hypertension. The prognosis with appropriate treatment, the five year survival, is some 83%. Okay, guys, coming back to our clinical question that we posed, we said all of the following vasculitic symptoms are thought to be due to immune complex deposition with one exception. What is that exception? Drum roll, please. Drrr, ding. GPA, granulomatosis with polyangiitis, right? So now, although the molecular pathology of most vasculitic syndromes is poorly understood, the deposition of immune complexes is commonly thought to play a role in vasculitis associated with Henoxion line purpura, cryovasculitis, that associated with hep C, serum sickness and cutaneous vasculitis syndromes, as well as polyritis nodosa associated with hepatitis B. Granulomatosis with polyangiitis, eosinophilic GPA, and microscopic polyangiitis are thought to be due to production of your antineutrophilic antibodies, so-called ANCA. Right, but pathogenic T lymphocyte responses have also been implicated in GPA, giant cell arthritis, tachyasus, and eosinophilic GPA. My friends, I hope you just allow me to encourage you from the, uh, the Bible. We're talking about the power of our words. Now, our words are by no means innocuous. Your words have significant power. The book of Proverbs, chapter 16, verse 24, tells us gracious words are like a honeycomb. Uh, bringing sweetness to the soul and health to the body. Proverbs 18 verse 21 says, Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat the fruit thereof. You know, there's an old saying, sticks and stones can break my bones, but words can never hurt me. Well, let me tell you, your words do have power. So pronounce positivity, pronounce blessing over your life in the name of Jesus. Have yourself a wonderful day. I'll see you soon with another video. 
on my channel, Internal Medicine, Algorithms and Mnemonics. Take care.